uh, I would like to make some clarification about the nozzle. So the nozzle is a dimensionless number that we predict or we come with equations for the nozzle from experimentation, okay? Someone goes to the lab, take a sphere, a fluid, take the Reynolds, and predict a nozzle equation. And those are the nozzle equations that you have in the tables of your book. And if you consult other heat transfer books, you will see that there are different nozzle correlations that might not be covered in this book, okay? And as an example, we can look the sphere section in your eighth edition, page, page 373 is the page I have here, uh, for spheres. And if you see, for example, a Mac Adams, and it, here is the reference of the scientists that published this work for the nozzle. For calculate the average heat transfer coefficient for a sphere heated or cooled by gas, he proposed this nozzle equation. And for Reynolds, the same scientists reduced just the Reynolds number and came up with this nozzle equation for Reynolds between one and 25, okay? But if you see in the next page, so this is just an image of an sphere in cross flow. If you see in the next page, we have another heat transfer, um, heat transfer correlation or nozzle correlation for liquids and also gases, right? That applies between Reynolds 3.5 and 7.6, 7.6 10 to the fourth, okay? So as you can see, these two are good for spheres when dealing with liquid or gases. And if you see the Reynolds number might overlap, right? Because the previous equation, this one, was recommended for Reynolds one to 25. And this one is recommended for Reynolds um, between 3.5 to 7.6, 10 to the four. So it might be an overlap, right? In the case of, of um, of gases because these two are for gases, but this one also, they can apply it to gas as well as liquid. So as you can see, and it's more evident from this plot, right? There are several correlations of experimental average heat transfer coefficients for flow over spheres. You see, like how many they are depending on the diameter of the sphere, the pressure employed in the experiment, and uh, for example, if you just took a Reynolds number of 10 to the three, you have like at least one, two, three points of the H value, right? That you can calculate for that Reynolds for a sphere in cross flow. And none of these approximations is bad. It means that the scientists did the, the experiment a little bit different. Maybe um, he changed, I don't know, a little bit the diameter of the sphere or the nature of the fluid or uh, because that's the way these H values are calculated. Someone goes to the lab and set up an experiment and get correlations out of it. And those are the correlations you have in your textbook. So what I'm trying to say is there's no good or bad correlations. There are several correlations reported by several different scientists. Some of them overlap. And even though you choose one or the other, you will be having, right, an H value that it would be in the proximity, right, of the other uh, H or nozzle equation proposed by someone else, okay? And um, once we start our problem session, one of the problems I will assign you either as homework or here in the classroom would be to compare the nozzles from different equations from different scientists and check how the H value changes with each approximation. So you can see they are not far away, internal convection. And again, we will cover in external, internal, natural, and phase change. And after completing those, we are going to have two problem sessions to keep practicing uh, how to solve problems related to convection. So internal force convection, what we are going to cover we are going to cover um, basics on internal force convection, flow rate and the Reynolds number, friction factor and pressure drop that becomes important. And this friction factor and pressure drop concept inside a pipe is something that you already revise in your fluid mechanics course. 
um, because it's where you go to all the Bernoulli equation and designing pipe systems, choosing a right pump, etc. Um, then we are going to evaluate the thermal energy balance and we are going to um, go in detail uh, through two cases of internal convection. That is the isothermal surface and the uniform heat flux surface. Uh, well, internal com forced convection, well, we are forcing the fluid, right? With a pump, typically. And as in external convection, the heat transfer occurs between a surface and the fluid. But the surface in this case is the inside surface of the pipe or the duct. That's why it's called internal convection, because now that we are forcing the fluid to pass inside the pipe, right? So internal convection, in this case, the flow fluid is completely confined in a solid boundary, right? Our pipe, for example, our, solid is, our fluid is completely enclosed by a solid boundary, the pipe itself. So total confinement of the fluid leads to a unique velocity and thermal boundary layer behavior. And what are the examples of internal force convection? Well, heat exchangers, again, right? Because one, we have one fluid passing inside the pipe and one fluid passing outside the pipe, right? Uh, pipes carrying hot and cold fluids, air dogs, right? He, heating and air conditioning. Automotive applications, exhaust system, fuel lines, and cooling system. So those are real life examples of where we can find internal force convection. So we need to revise some important terms that uh, I'm sure you check in your fluid mechanics book. So we need to recall those again. So we are going to do a brief review of fluid mechanics at this point. And one of those terms that we need to review is the mass flow rate. And the mass flow rate is the rate at which a given mass of fluid passes a section of pipe per unit of time, right? So the mass flow rate, if you consider uh, this fluid flowing inside a pipe, is the density of the fluid multiplied by the mean, mean velocity of the fluid multiplied by the cross-sectional area of the pipe or a duct. What is the cross-sectional area of a circular pipe? by the square over four, right? So that's one of the questions we just need to recall, mass flow rate. So another definition we need to have in mind from our fluid mechanics course is the volumetric flow rate. And it's the rate at which a given volume of fluid passes a section of pipe per unit of time. Um, volume flow rate, this kind of um, interpretation of, of the rate, in terms of the volume is commonly used in heating, ventilating, and air conditioning applications. And typically in those applications, we report volumetric flow rates in cubic feet uh, per minute or gallon per minute. Uh, how we calculate the volume flow rate or the volumetric flow rate? Um, well, units volume divided by time, right? Uh, the mean fluid velocity times the cross-sectional area of the pipe. So, how we define the flow condition? Well, again, with the Reynolds number, right? Uh, we can define if we have laminar, like in this case, less than 2300. Uh, if we have transitional between 2300 and 10,000, and more than 10,000 turbulent uh, flow region. Um, it should be uh, noted at this point that the boundary conditions change a little bit, right? So how's going to be the velocity here? at the near wall, zero, right? Because it's where, where the fluid uh, feels more the effect of the wall, right? The Reynolds number, we already know, that is a dimensionless parameter that can help us to describe the flow as laminar, transitional, or turbulent. For a circular pipe, the Reynolds number is the mean fluid velocity times the inside diameter of the pipe divided by the kinematic viscosity. That is a property of the fluid that we can read from tables, right? Uh, here I have the Reynolds in terms for a pipe, again, for a circular pipe, in terms of mass flow rate and the Re Reynolds in terms of volumetric flow rate. 
In case, for example, your problem is giving you mass flow rate, you can just put directly the mass flow rate and get the Reynolds, same thing with the volumetric flow rate. Uh, here you have the, um, the limits for considering laminar, transitional, and turbulent. And I know that several books a little bit change these numbers. Some of them consider 2400 to be the limit. So just in case you consult any other, any other textbook, 30, 2300 is the one for this textbook. What I need you to take note is Reynolds for circular pipe, Reynolds in terms of mass flow rate, then Reynolds in terms of volumetric flow rate. Again, this is for circular pipes, right? We are not considering any other geometry. Sometimes we don't have circular cross-sectional areas. Like for example, in the air ducts, right? They typically are square, right? So then we need to redefine the diameter in terms of the equivalent diameter for this non-circular section. And we redefine this non-circular diameter and as the hydraulic diameter, okay? So again, this is when you have an other than um, circular cross-sectional area. So the hydraulic diameter is calculated by this simple formula, four times the cross-sectional area divided by the wet perimeter. The wet perimeter is the duct perimeter that is in contact with the fluid. Um, and I put here a note of caution here for you, include the entire perimeter that is weighted by the fluid regardless of the duct cross-sectional cross shape. So whatever is wet, you include it there. So four times the cross-sectional area divided the weight perimeter is how we calculate our hydraulic diameters for like ventilation systems when we have cross-sectional areas square, right? Where the fluid is passing through those square typically square or rectangular cross-sectional areas. So let's solve a simple problem to recall how to calculate the hydraulic diameter and the Reynolds number using the hydraulic diameter. So this is just an image here, how it shows in your textbook, again, the definition of the hydraulic diameter. That is cross-sectional area times the wet perimeter and the wet perimeter is this shape, whatever it is, the shape that is wetted, that is what you are going to count. So we have air flowing through an annular space of the dock shown in the figure below at a mean velocity of six meters per second. If the air temperature is 30 Celsius, what is the Reynolds number? So to calculate the Reynolds number, we need to first calculate the hydraulic diameter because we have a cross-sectional area that is not circular, right? It's an annular space. The air is passing through here, right? Through here. So we need to calculate first the hydraulic diameter and with that hydraulic diameter, calculate the Reynolds number, right? Uh, we need the properties of air at 30 Celsius, especially the kinematic viscosity. Knowing the kinematic viscosity, we can get the Reynolds. So the hydraulic diameter, again, is four times the area divided by the wet perimeter. What is the area? Pi d squared over four pi d is only the diameter. So the air flows through the annular space of the dock. So I just make my little figure here where this area is where the air is passing. Um, at the mean velocity of six meters per second. If the air temperature is 30 Celsius, what is the Reynolds number? So the kinematic viscosity at 30 Celsius for air is 16.19, 10 to the minus six meter square second. The cross-sectional area of the annular space is pi d squared over four, right? but you have a big D and a small D, right? So big D is 18 centimeters and a small D is five because you need to do that difference, right? Because that's the area that is wet, right? That's a cross-sectional area where the air is flowing, right? So pi D, my big diameter in meters, I have 18 centimeters in meters is 0.18 squared minus my small diameter, that is five centimeters 
or 0 0.05 meters. That gives me a cross-sectional area of the annular space of 0 0.0235 meters square. Okay, so again, it's just pi d squared over four. You just make the difference of big minus small because that's the cross-sectional area of the annular space. Um, now the wet perimeter, remember, is a perimeter that is wetted by the fluid regardless the cross-sectional shape of the geometry we are evaluating. So it's pi d, right? But it's going to be pi plus d, big d plus small d, right? So that gives me a wetted perimeter of 0.7226 meters. Now I can calculate the hydraulic diameter with the formula four times the cross-sectional area divided by the wet perimeter. I have the wetted area that I calculate here divided by the wet perimeter that I calculate here. So I have a hydraulic diameter of 0.13 meters. Now that I know the hydraulic diameter, I can get the Reynolds number with that hydraulic diameter, right? So the mean velocity of the air flowing through the annular area is six meters per second, times the hydraulic diameter 0.13, divided by the kinematic viscosity of air at 30 Celsius. That gives me 4.8, 10 to the four. And the flow is turbulent, obviously. We have a 10 to the four number there. So first you calculate the cross-sectional area of the shape you are evaluating, wet perimeter by the fluid, right? And then you use that hydraulic diameter for calculating the Reynolds. When do you do this? Where the cross-sectional area is other, other than a circular cross-sectional area. In this case, we have a, an annular cross-sectional area. And this kind of uh, shape you have it in double pipe heat exchangers. When you have a small pipe inside or enclosed a big pipe, one fluid flowing inside the small pipe and another one flu flowing out in the outside pipe. Friction factor and pressure drop. Uh, well, these two terms become important when dealing with internal flow, the pressure drop in the pipe of the duct, and we need to know obviously the friction factor too, right? Um, so to find pressure drop due to friction factor, we define the Darcy friction factor. And we have this equation here where F is the Darcy friction factor, delta P is the pressure drop, L is the length of the pipe, D is the diameter or hydraulic diameter if it is not a circular cross-sectional area, rho is the density of the fluid, and um, U is the mean velocity of the fluid and applies to all internal flows, all of them, laminar, transitional, and turbulent. Very important, do not confuse the friction factor with the friction coefficient that we define for external force convection when we talk about the Reynolds and Chilton carbon analogies, remember? So don't confuse those. So this equation, the Darcy friction factor, if you can see, help us to calculate the pressure drop inside a line when we know the friction factor, right? And the friction factor for a fully laminar flow in circular pipe, in circular pipe, is 64 over the Reynolds. And if you remember, your, your fluid mechanics book has a table when you don't have non-circular non cross-sectional areas. And this 64 change by 54 or 24 or any other constant depending on the shape of the cross-sectional area. So this is for a circular pipe, fully developed laminar flow. You apply 64 over the Reynolds. If you don't have laminar flow, right, that friction factor for transitional flow and entire turbulent flow can be calculated by this equation, and this is the Halland equation, and applies for a large range of Reynolds in the transitional and turbulent regime, and also for a, a large range of the relative roughness of the pipe. And um, so if you remember, D, the diameter of the pipe divided by epsilon, that is the roughness, is the relative roughness of the pipe. And the roughness is a measure of the average height of small peaks and bumps 
on the inside surface of the pipe, right? And we have tables to get this roughness, right? You have tables like, for example, uh, plastic, that the roughness is going to be almost negligible, right? Or when you have new pipes, or when you have aluminum pipes, or copper pipes. So you have tables available uh, elsewhere or everywhere for different types of, of pipes and duct materials. What if you don't want to use this equation, the Halland equation? Well, you use the Moody chart, right? Do you remember the Moody chart? Yeah, you should remember this one. This is like everyday in fluid mechanics, right? Yeah, so that's good. Uh, so this is the Moody chart, and the Moody chart, you have it in figure 717 in your textbook. And it's a friction factor versus the Reynolds number for laminar and turbulent tubes in in various surface, with various surface roughness. So here to the right side, you have the relative roughness of the pipe, right? Here in the X axis, you have the Reynolds number. And here in the Y axis, you have the friction factor. This uh, Moody chart is very friendly because it shows you the equation for laminar flow that we were discussing, the 64 over the Reynolds for circular pipes, right? And um, it, it marks you when you have the laminar, the transitional zone, and obviously the turbulent, the turbulent area of the Moody chart. So in case you don't want to use this equation, right, the Halland equation, you can just use the Moody chart and do a reading of the friction factor. And then with the friction factor, you can get the delta P in the pipe. And now in the delta P, you can, re you can calculate pumping powers, right? Uh, let's go through some general relations uh, for thermal energy associated with the flow of uh, fluid through a pipe or a duct. Uh, so if we apply an energy balance to a differential control volume of our pipe, uh, we can calculate the convective heat transfer from the pipe also from a general energy balance, MCP delta T. So our general energy balance is valid, okay, to calculate the convective heat transfer from the pipe to the fluid. So that's something that you need to have in mind, where Q is the total convective heat transfer between the fluid and the pipe. M is the mass flow rate that we defined in previous slides, right? CP is the specific heat at constant pressure that we can get from tables for the fluid we're evaluating. TV out, is the bulk temperature of the outlet, and TV in is the bulk temperature at the inlet, the bulk temperature, okay? That's very important. So we can then use the our general energy balance to calculate the convective heat transfer uh, from the pipe to the fluid when we are dealing with internal convection. So that's a very important equation to have in mind. So this is another equation, take note of this equation. And this equation serves us to calculate any of the missing temperatures, like the T wall, for example, or the TV out, or it can be used, I, I want that you take this note, this equation, when you have an isothermal surface, again, isothermal surface, the temperature is not going to change, you maintain it constant with a furnace there at 20 Celsius, 40 Celsius, isothermal surface. This equation can help you to find the convective heat transfer coefficient for an isothermal surface if you know all the temperatures, okay? So this is an important equation for isothermal surfaces. So take note of this equation. This applies for isothermal surfaces. So TW or TS is the surface temperature or the T wall of the pipe. M is the mass flow rate. CP is the specific heat at constant pressure. Uh, TV out is the bulk temperature at the outlet. TV in is the bulk temperature at the inlet. P is the wet perimeter, okay? Wet perimeter, we already defined it. The perimeter that is wetted, but our fluid, right? Whatever is the shape. L is the 
entire length of the pipe. But if, for example, the problem says calculate per meter length, well, you put there one meter, right? And H is the average sheet transfer coefficient. So again, when we use this equation, when we are dealing with isothermal surfaces that are maintained at constant temperature, and we can use it to calculate H or convective heat transfer coefficient if we know the wall, the outlet, and the inlet bulk temperatures. Okay, so let's solve an isothermal surface. So we have a horizontal clean steel pipe, 75 meters in length with an inside diameter of eight centimeters and carries water at a mass flow rate of 80 kilograms per second. The bulk inlet and outlet temperatures are 20 and 50. So we have the bulk, the bulk inlet temperature and the bulk outlet temperature. If the pipe surface is maintained uniform, that means it's an isothermal surface, we can use our isothermal equation, right? At 80 Celsius, find first the pumping power required, and then the average heat transfer coefficient. As a commonly used the standard reference temperature on which the fluid properties are based for internal flow is the average bulk temperature. Employ it in this problem to get the properties from the table. Also consider the roughness of the pipe to be 0 0.05. That epsilon is going to be 0 0.0545 millimeters. So I write here for you the commonly standard reference. So in internal convection, you remember that in external convection, you read the properties at the film temperature, the average of the solid and the fluid. So in internal convection, we read the properties at the average of the bulk. Okay, so that's an important note you need to do. So as I commonly use the standard reference temperature of which fluid properties are based on internal convection is the average bulk temperature. So first step to do, calculate the average bulk and then read the properties, right, of the fluid at the average bulk. So first step, I'm going to get the average bulk. Average bulk is TB in plus TB out or T bulk in plus T bulk out divided by two. How much is my bulk in? 20, how much is my bulk out? 50, 20 plus 50 divided by two is 35. So I'm going to read the properties of the water at 35 Celsius or 308 Kelvin. As I already told you, I have the exact properties because the book provided to me already interpolated. So I have the properties at 35. The density is 994.0 kilograms cubic meter, CP, 4183 joules kilogram Kelvin. Uh, the viscosity is 719.6 10 to the minus 6 kilograms meter second. The kinematic viscosity is 72.39 10 to the minus 8 meter square second. So we have other information given, such as the mass flow rate being 80 kilograms per second. The temperature of the wall, constant temperature of the wall of 80. Celsius, the length of our pipe is 75 meters, the diameter is 0 0.08 meters. The roughness of the steel pipe is also given as data, okay, so it's 0 0.045 millimeters. Then the relative roughness is the diameter divided by the roughness, right? That's the relative roughness. Diameter 0 0.08 divided by the, rel by the roughness of a new style pipe. I'm not sure if your book has roughness tables. I don't think so. Um, I don't think so. To be sincere, I couldn't find them unless I missed them. Uh, yeah. Let me check. No, I cannot find them. So in that case, I will provide you the roughness or I will look for a good table for roughness and share them with you. Um, so the Reynolds number then is four times the mass flow rate divided by pi, diameter, and the viscosity. Okay, so I'm calculating here the Reynolds number in terms of the mass flow rate. So four times the mass flow rate of 80 kilograms per second divided by pi, diameter of the, of the pipe, 
and then the viscosity in kilograms meters seconds. So I get a Reynolds number of 1.77 10 to the 6, uh, which is for sure fully developed turbulent. We have a 10 to the to the um, 10 to the 6 there for the Reynolds. So we for sure have turbulent. So you have two options: how to calculate the friction factor, or you use the Halland equation, or you use Moody chart, whatever you want. Okay. You have relative roughness and you have the Reynolds. You can read from Moody. Or you can apply the Halland equation. That is the equation I have in here. So either one you like to, you will have a friction factor of 0 0.0175. Uh, using the equation, that's the value. Again, feel free to use Moody chart. Um, then we need to calculate the uh, the uh, average velocity of the pipe. Why? Because we need it for our pressure drop equation. Okay. Uh, so the average velocity is the mass flow rate divided by density and the cross sectional area. And that's an equation. Um, we get the average velocity from the mass flow rate definition equation I gave you on top of the slides, right? So again, Average velocity, mass flow rate divided by density, cross-sectional area. That gives us an average velocity of 16 meters per second. Um, then we are ready to get the pressure drop of the pipe, right? Using the friction factor, Darcy friction factor equation. So delta P is 2.09 megapascal. How we calculate then the pumping power? Is delta P times? volumetric flow rate, right? Pumping power, delta P times volumetric flow rate. I have already my delta P here, right? From Darcy friction factor equation, but I need the volumetric flow rate. And I know that the volumetric flow rate is mass divided by density, right? Because that allows me to, to eliminate these kilograms and have volume divided by time. So I multiply this value of the pressure drop in the pipe times the volumetric flow rate, and that gives me the pumping power. That is 168 kilowatts. So again, the Reynolds number, why? Because you need to get the friction factor either from Moody chart or Halland equation. Once you have the friction factor, you can apply the Darcy friction factor equation to get the delta P in the pipe. Right, and then just you need to do a change between um, mass flow rate to volumetric flow rate to multiply by delta P and get the pumping power. 